Hello. If you don't know me, I'm Andrew. I'm an assistant pastor here at King's. And today I'm really excited to be kicking off our new preach series called Origins. We're going to be looking at God, humanity, and the world in Genesis 1 to 3. Now, Genesis 1 to 3 are the very first chapters in the Bible, and they are vitally important for understanding the story that goes throughout the rest of the Bible. They kind of form a, a, a prologue or an introduction, telling us some important stuff which makes sense of what goes on from there. And sometimes you get this kind of prologue or introduction in films. You might meet some key characters or see some key events, find out some key information, which as the story goes on is going to be really important. Disney often does this. Many of the classic Disney movies have important prologues. Things like The Lion King. In the circle of life, you learn about Simba, the heir apparent to the throne in the animal kingdom and why, why he is so important. Uh, in The Beauty and the Beast, you find out who this beast is and why this rose, which will be so important in this story, is actually so important. And of course, in Frozen, you find out about Elsa's magical powers, about why Anna has to be hidden away from her and why Elsa has to be kept behind closed doors. These prologues give us really important information, people, key events, which as the story goes on will help us to understand what's happening. That's kind of what Genesis 1 to 3 do for the story of the Bible. And in the process of doing that, Genesis 1 to 3 also introduced some really important teaching on topics which are still hugely relevant to us today. And those are the things we're going to focus in in this origin series. Because sadly, often those really important teachings get kind of lost or maybe kind of pushed to one side by debates and questions which rage over these chapters. There are debates about evolution and special creation, about how literal or non-literal these characters are, uh, chapters are, about when and how things happened. And all those questions are fine to ask. Many of them have been asked for thousands of years, but they're not actually the key point of the text. When the author sat down to write Genesis 1 to 3, and that was probably Moses, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. He, he wasn't really seeking to engage with scientific debates and scientific questions, but he was seeking to teach us about some of these really important topics. And so we're going to focus in on some of those, one each week as we go through the series. But you might want to kind of think a bit about some of those debates and questions to find out more for yourself. And so I'm going to post a blog later today on the church website, which will just point you to some helpful resources, things to read or to listen to if you want to explore further on those points. Today, we're going to start with the first chapter, with Genesis 1. And we're going to look at the key point, the key truth of Genesis 1, which is about God himself. And I want to start by reading the entirety of Genesis 1, actually right through to chapter 2, verse 3, because that all together is one kind of a coherent narrative, one passage together. And that's a slightly longer uh, part of Scripture than we might be used to reading or to hearing on a Sunday morning, but sometimes it's really good for us to hear a good chunk of Scripture together. So let's read Genesis 1 through to 2, 3 together. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth. And the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, 
Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures, and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kinds, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image. After our likeness, And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, And every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, are giving every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. What is Genesis 1 about? Well, it's about creation. It's about the goodness of the physical world. Notice it was good, it was good, it was good. Eventually it was very good. It's about order and structure, things being according to their kinds. But above anything else, Genesis 1 is about God. And in some ways, that is so obvious that actually it's easy to miss it, or easy to see it and immediately to skip on to something else. But it's so important with the Bible to stop and ask, what is it telling us about God? We can become so used to talking about God that we forget who we're actually talking about. We don't think what he is actually like. And God is kind of something that everyone has a vague concept of God. In our culture, if you have a conversation, even with someone who's not a follower of Jesus or doesn't believe in any kind of uh, real God, if you talk about God, they're going to understand what you mean. No one's really going to say, oh, hang on a minute, what's that God word you keep using? What are you actually talking about there? We all have a vague concept, but that doesn't mean we all understand God in the same way. It's a bit like I could have a present here, beautifully wrapped, maybe a nice bow. We don't look at that and agree that's a present. We could talk about the present and know what we're talking about, but that doesn't mean we all know what's inside. It doesn't mean we all have the same idea of what's going on inside that present. We could have very different ideas. The same thing often happens with God. We talk about God as if it's like the outside of the present, but actually what we actually mean by that, who we think God is, can be very different. And often people kind of make God in the image they want him to be in. It's the God how they think he should be or how they want him to be. Sometimes you even hear that in things people say. People say, well, my God isn't like that. My God wouldn't do that. My God wouldn't say that. 
To be honest, some people say that, I kind of want to say, I don't really care what your God is like. I care what the God who created heaven and earth is like. We need to get to know the real God, the living God, the creator God. What is he like? And above anything else, Genesis 1 is about that God. Notice he's at the very start of the chapter and the very end of the chapter. He's mentioned in pretty much every single verse, and nothing happens without the say-so of God in this chapter. God is at the center of Genesis 1. And so what is it that this passage teaches us about this God? Well, there are many things. We could spend plenty of time talking about that, but I'm going to highlight one, the most obvious but a vitally important one, that he is the creator. God himself is uncreated. He is outside of the creation. He is before the creation, but he is the creator of all. That's the, the key point of this passage. And in some ways, it's very obvious from the first reading. It's there in verse 1. In the beginning, God created. It happens in all of those six days that God creates things. But there's a little bit more we can find as well. We're told more about this creator. One thing is we're shown that this God is the only God and creator. You see, when these chapters were written... Ancient Israel was surrounded by other cultures, most of which believed in multiple gods. So there were lots of different gods. And these gods worked together, or actually more often in their stories, kind of fought and had a bit of a war, and then created the world out of that. Genesis 1 is showing us God who created everything is the only God and the only creator. And even the things that other cultures thought were gods, things like the sun and the moon, which people believed were gods, actually are just created by the living God. They're just greater lights and lesser lights, the creations of the one creator God. This God is the only God and creator. But also Genesis 1 shows us he is a powerful creature. If you look at the um, creation stories of these other kind of cultures, all these different gods, the gods are weak little things and they're chaotic. They normally fight each other or fight these kind of powers of chaos to subdue them into submission to make the creation. There's no power, there's no control, there's chaos, there's mess, there's anarchy often. There's none of that in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, there is no battle. There is no struggle. God creates seemingly with no effort at all. He is a powerful creator. So in this passage, we find God is the creator of all, and he's the only God and creator, and he is a powerful creator. You might then ask, though, well, does that really matter? Does it still matter for us in our day and age that God created everything? And the answer is yes. It really matters in many, many different ways. It's really important to us, but I'm going to pick one and highlight it for us this morning. It really matters that God is the creator of all, because actually God as the creator is at the very heart of the gospel, the very heart of the good news of the Christian message. Because God is the creator and we are the created, we have responsibilities towards him. We have obligations towards him, obligations to give him thanks and worship and obedience. That's our right and our fitting response as the creatures to the creator. But the sad reality is every single one of us as humans fails to do that. We fail to give to God the honor, the thanks, the obedience that we ought to we fail as creatures in relationship with our Creator. And that's what the Bible defines as sin. And in fact, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, in the first chapter of his letter, uh, letter to the church in Rome, he defines sin and explains it in exactly this way. He first points out that the created world around us reveals the Creator. Here's what he says in verse 19 of Romans 1. For what can be known about God is plain to them, that's to us, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that be made. Paul's telling us there's enough in the created world around us that we know God is there, and therefore we should give him thanks and honor and worship. But the problem is we don't. Paul goes on, verse 21, For although they knew God... That's us, all of us. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. He goes on, verse 23, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God, the creator God, 
for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Notice there the very deliberate use of the language of Genesis 1. This is Paul interpreting Genesis 1 for us. There's enough in creation for us to know that God is there, to know that we should give him thanks and honor and obedience, but instead we give that to created things. Paul summarizes this in verse 25. We worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. Our greatest problems as humans is that we fail in our obligations as creatures to our creator. We are therefore, Paul says, without excuse, and we are under the judgment of God. But the gospel, the glorious good news of the Christian message, is about restoring us to a right relationship with our Creator, not just in a relational sense, but also returning us to the position of creatures who can rightly relate to their Creator. How does it do that? Well, our greatest problem was our failure to fulfill our obligations to our Creator. But God's greatest gift is that the Creator stepped into the creation. The Creator God Himself comes to live among us as a human. Jesus, the Son of God, the one through whom all things were created, comes to live on earth, fully human, fully God, and He lives the perfect life that you and I never did. He's the one who lives the life that we as creatures should have lived under our Creator And then he suffers and he dies. And if he suffers and dies, he takes upon himself the punishment that you and I should receive for our failure to fulfill those creaturely obligations. And then he is raised from the dead. So he now has the power to save us from our sins, to reconcile us to God. If you read the New Testament, you'll find that for Christian life, worship and obedience are absolutely central. One of the reasons that is, is because the gospel brings us back into a right relationship with our Creator. So we as creatures under the Creator bring Him everything that we should. We fulfill those obligations. The gospel restores us not only to recognize there is a Creator, but to relate rightly to Him. Our great problem was our rejection of the Creator. The wonderful, glorious good news of the gospel is that the Creator stepped into the creation to restore us to himself. Maybe the worship team could head back up at this point. So let me ask you, how are you doing as a creature living under your Creator? Maybe you have never asked Jesus to save you. Maybe, actually, you're aware even today that you are still under the judgment of God. Friend, today, you can come back to the Creator. You can confess your failures as a creature. You can ask God for forgiveness, and you can commit yourself to a life of thanks and of worship and of obedience to your Creator. Or maybe today you are a follower of Jesus. This is an opportunity for us to thank him afresh for restoring us to the creator, but also to think of our own lives. Are we fulfilling those obligations of creature to creation and to commit ourselves again to that life of thanks, worship, and obedience? And we're going to respond together now by taking bread and wine, this meal that Jesus commands us to take, to remember what he has done for us and to partake in what he has done for us. We take and break and eat the bread, remembering Jesus' body broken for us on the cross. We take and drink the wine, remembering his blood poured out for our sins, paying the price for our sins. And today is an opportunity to respond to that as we do that. Maybe you've never responded to Jesus. You can take the bread and wine for the very first time today and in your own heart express your uh, repentance of your sin and your desire to follow Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's a chance to give thanks. It's also a chance to examine ourselves. We're encouraged to do that when we take the bread and wine. How am I doing in fulfilling my obligations as a creature to the Creator? An opportunity to commit ourselves again to that life of thanks, of worship, and of obedience. So we're going to take the bread and the wine in our own homes. It might be in your own, it might be with other people. We're going to worship the band and going to lead us as we do that. Let me just pray that the Holy Spirit would help us as we respond together. Lord God, we acknowledge you as the creator of all. And we acknowledge too that we are creatures created by you. 
And Father, we confess that so often we have failed in our obligations as creatures to our Creator. But we thank you so much that you, the Creator, stepped into the creation, that we might be forgiven, we might be saved, and we might be reconciled to you. Help us right now, I pray, Lord God, to examine our own hearts, to confess to you our sins where we need to, to draw on the forgiveness that you have available to us, and to freshly commit ourselves as creatures under the Creator to a life of thanks and of worship and of obedience. Holy Spirit, we pray, please come and help us in this now. Amen.